Good morning, everybody. This is Thomas Felder, and we are here this morning with another edition of our Daniel and Revelation Bible study series. We are on Revelation chapter 17, Revelation chapter 17. And today we're going to talk about Babylon the Great. We're going to talk about Babylon the Great. Today is Sabbath, so today's Bible studies are always extra special on Sabbath. They're extra special on Sabbath. Let's pray and get right into it. Of course, you know, we never, never, never have enough time, so we want to make the most of it. Dear Father in heaven, please be with us. Give us grace, give us wisdom, give us peace. Hide me behind the cross, Father, that you might be lifted up and others may be drawn unto you. We ask these and so many more blessings in your holy son, Jesus the Messiah, Yahshua's name. Amen, amen, and amen again. All right, so we're on Revelation chapter 17, and we're talking about Babylon the Great. Who is Babylon? Who is Babylon? We've been talking about Babylon for weeks now, but Babylon is a system of false worship. God would not warn his people to come out of Babylon if it was impossible for people to identify Babylon. And just in case you, you didn't see Babylon in all of the chapters that we went through up until now, God takes extra precaution in Revelation 17 to give you some more identifying markers. You ever played this game called Clue? Anybody ever played Clue? And in Clue, you can, you, you gotta find out who done it, right? And they give you all of these clues. So here we have some more clues. We get some more clues. Uh, in 1 Peter 5.13, Peter was in Rome, and he writes um, a, a, in, in 1 Peter 5.13, he says, the church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, salute you, and, do, and so doeth Marcus, my son. So he writes a letter, and he says he's writing from the church that is at Babylon, right? The, the actual Babylon had been destroyed at this point, and he's writing from Rome. Right, so this is um, First Peter, and Peter's writing about Rome. James Cardinal Gibbons, one of the cardinals in the Catholic Church, he says the word Babylon being symbolic of the corruption then prevailing in the city of the Caesars. We know that papal Rome got its, I mean, papal Rome got its power from pagan Rome, right, from the emperors. So this is this is James Cardinal Gibbons in his own words saying that uh, Babylon was symbolic of the corruption prevailing in the city of the Caesars. Babylon is made of three parts. Remember, Rome was made of three parts. Remember, we had Eastern Rome, Western Rome, and for a short time, we had Central Rome under the three sons of Constantine. So Babylon is also made up of three parts. We read about that yesterday. It has three parts. It has the dragon, right? Dragon is the one part of Babylon, and that represents all forms of paganism, spiritualism, Satanism, all of these other doctrines and religions, they are all bound up in the dragon. The second part of, of Babylon is the beast. The beast represents the papacy. It's the papacy. It is, it is the false prophet, right? No, sorry. It is the apostate church. It is the apostate church. And then there is Protestantism, Protestantism, which in the Bible is called apostate Protestantism, right? Each component is fueled by Satan. Satan is the one that gives power to Babylon. Last night, we were reading in the book called Great Controversy, and it was talking about Lucifer. And it talks about this spirit of Lucifer. I want to read a little bit to you. And it tells you and explains what, what is behind Babylon. What's the real purpose? Remember, we said everything in Revelation is about worship. Everything in this Bible from Genesis to Revelation is about worship, worship either to God or to Lucifer or Satan at this point. Here's, here's a quote from the book. It says, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. It's talking about Lucifer. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. We find that in Ezekiel 28, 17. Lucifer came to indulge a desire for self-exaltation. He says, thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God. Thou hast says, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Remember, angels are called stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. We find that in Isaiah chapter 14. Lucifer, this prince of angels, aspired to the power and of the prerogative, which was Christ and Christ alone. Here it is. 
That's what this whole controversy is about. And Babylon says they want to be worshiped like God. They want it to be God men. Let's start with verse one. Verse one is no way, no better way to study the Bible than actually reading it. Revelation 17, one. And it says, and there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials and talk with me saying, come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. In the Bible, a woman represents a church and a daughter of Zion shall become a comely and delicate woman according to Jeremiah. Isaiah says that the church is a pure bride set aside for Christ. We find in Isaiah 62 verse five, it says, for as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. He's talking about God was married to Israel, his church, right? Hosea describes the union of God and his people by saying, and I will betroth thee unto me forever. I will marry you, he's saying. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness. Often in the Bible, this, this church is referred as refers to as a virgin, like a woman who has not slept with another man. So he says that if a, a, a virgin church or a pure church is a virgin, what does he call a church that is a whore or a church that sleeps around, right? He calls it a whore and it sits upon many waters. So let's continue to go through. Verse two, Revelation 17, verse two. It is says, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So this is a nation or a, a church who has lost its ability to spread the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit. It has now turned to the government and civil powers to enforce its edicts and rules to get people to comply. In Ephesians chapter five, we see that Jesus is the spiritual husband of his church. And as the husband of the church, he was supposed to guide the church, but not this woman, not this church. She goes to the civil leaders and government and she, she is over many waters. She's over many waters. So in a minute, we'll see that the Bible says that many waters represent many people, many doctrines, many tongues, many languages. So it is a worldwide church. Verse three, verse three, Revelation 17, verse three. And it says, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and 10 horns. So the woman rides the beast. The woman is in charge of the beast. If you sit on a horse, even though the horse is more powerful than you, if you hold the reins of the horse, who's in control? You or the horse, right? So this woman is, is running the world. Beyonce puts it beautifully in a song. She says, who rules the world? And she says, girls. And I know so often we think that she's just talking about a woman or a female. No, she's talking about a church, a church that rules the world. The Bible says, has full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and 10 horns, right? So it has a scarlet color as well. So when we look in the Bible, color is important. Color is important. Let's look and see what the Bible says about this scarlet color. In Ezekiel 23, verses 14 to 16, it says the Chaldeans or the Babylonians are portrayed in red, which is vermilion, which is a deep, dark, rich red color with belts around their waist, all of them looked like Babylonian chariot officers. The Pope is preceded in procession by his cardinals and they are resplendent with red robes and cardinals and the Roman Catholic church are like the princes in the kingdom. Do you remember when we studied in Daniel, Daniel chapter five, Daniel chapter five, verse 16, Belteshazzar sees a vision of a man writing on the wall. Well, he sees a hand a bloodless hand writing on the wall. It said, Meany, Meany, tickle you, Farisan. You have been weighed in the balances and found one thing. And, and the king called for someone to interpret the dream. The, the king's mother finds Daniel, and the king offers Daniel what? 
in order to interpret the dream. He offered him three things. He offered him a scarlet robe or a red robe. He offers him a gold chain and he offers him the third seat in the kingdom, right? A scarlet, a scarlet robe, a gold chain, and he was going to make him third in the kingdom. So this red or scarlet attire originally is attributed to the princes of Babylon. It represented their status, their wealth, and their power. You ever see men with a red tie? You ever see a man with a red tie? It represents his status, his wealth, and his power, all right? So God has just given some, some ways that we can identify Babylon. And it says, verse 4, Revelation 17, 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones, having a golden cup in her hand, full of the abominations of filthiness and fornication. Well, the colors of the woman in this, in this picture now is arrayed in purple and scarlet. Well, purple is the color of royalty. In the book of Judges, chapter 8, verse 26, it says the kings of Midian were identified by their purple robes. Do you remember when they tried to crucify Christ? In Matthew 15, 17, they clothed him with a robe of purple. They put a crown of thorns on his head and they make believe like they were worshiping him. They did not know that he was really the king of kings and lord of lords. They were doing it as a mockery had they known that he was really the king. So they put a purple robe on him. Purple represents royalty. And the reason or the way you get purple is when you combine red, which represents sacrifice. In some ways, it represents sacrifice, a blood sacrifice. And you put it with the law. In the Bible, law was considered to be blue. That was the color of the, the robes that the priests wore. They wore a piece of their robe was blue, which represented the law. That's why you see policemen, they are called the men in blue. That's why they wear blue uniforms, right? Blue represented the law. If you put the law and the sacrifice together, you get purple, which represents royalty, right? So these Catholic cardinals frequently wear scarlet, and they wear scarlet, which is a deep red color. They wear it on Good Friday, Palm Sunday, Pentecost, and other special occasions. And then the bishops also wear purple on Advent, Lent, and at funerals, right? But look at this woman. It says, and it says, um, and the woman was arrayed in purple and having a golden cup in her hand full of the abominations of filthiness and fornication. The Roman church is the only church that, that represents itself as a woman holding a golden chalice in her hand. And the woman is called Fetus. She is a goddess called Fetus. And, and if you can see there, this is one of the gold coins that I put up on the screen. And she has a cup. Inside the cup is wine. And if you can see right at the tip of the cup is the sun. The sun is coming out of the cup. Wine in the Bible symbolized doctrine, right? And out of the cup comes the sun, which is one of the main doctrines that is held by this woman church, which was sun worship. Also, if you look at the woman, she's holding a cross. The cross represents the, the the sacrifice of Christ or the death of Christ. It is symbolic of the death of Christ. And this is the way that the Roman church identifies itself. You know, it's, it's amazing how the Bible lines up with its own, with their own understanding of themselves. And according to Revelation 17, the cup is full of abominations and filthiness and fornication. So is the church having literal fornication with, with kings of the other nations? Maybe. But, but the, the Bible here is really talking about spiritual fornication. It is called idol worship. One of the things that this church has been accused of is worshiping idols, literal statues. What are some of the other abominations that come out of this church? Sunday worship, celibacy, purgatory, indulgences, veneration of Mary. Those are just some of the things that come out of it. It also talks about its wealth, right? So it says the woman was decked with, with gold and precious stones and pearls. This is the official Pope's uh, tiara or his triple crown. And this triple crown represents the Pope's power is threefold. Remember we talked about the number 666, it meant man above, man on the level and man below or man on the earth in the middle and man below. 
So these three crowns represent that the Pope has power above, right? Because he can make heavenly decrees. He can tell people their sins are forgiven. And then there's on earth. On earth, he can tell kings what to do. And then he has a crown below. That means that he has the right or the ability, at least he claims to, to free people from purgatory or hell, right? So these are some of the things that he claims. On the Vatican website, it says that these three crowns, one is the symbol of the church's sovereignty over the states, meaning that they have the right and the ability to tell kings what to do. And the second, the second thing that this three crown um, tiara represents is to show that his spiritual authority was superior to any civic authority. Meaning that if you ever play chess, if you ever play chess, they got all of the pieces. And the one piece that can take out the king is the bishop, right? The bishop can take out the king. And the third thing is it symbolizes the Pope's moral authority over all secular monarchs. So he is the one that tells the, the king what is right or wrong or tells the president what is right or wrong. He, he has the last word, at least according to their position. Let's go to verse five. And upon her head was a name written, mystery, Babylon the great, mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Right? So these are the names that she has on her forehead. Do you remember in the Bible, God says that his priests were supposed to have their names on his heads, righteousness to God. That's what the priest in the Bible had on their forehead. And in the forehead meant that this is the way you think. It's, it's your intention. It's, it's cognitive. But you also know that if it's on your forehead, it is open and apparent and people can see. A lot of these things that we have talked about are open things. Right? You don't have to sort of go to some secret chamber to see some of these aspects that we have talked about. So it says on her, on her forehead was written mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. We have four different titles come back to this church. So let's go through them and see what we can find. Rome itself applies the term mystery to its own institutions and teachings. It has the Holy Trinity which it calls in the Catholic Catechism, number 261, it says the mystery of the Holy Trinity is the central mystery of the Christian faith and Christian life. In fact, it says all other mysteries of the Catholic Church is based on the Trinity. There's the mysteries of the rosary. There's the mysteries of the mass, right? So there's the part where it deals about the mystery. Rome also claims to be the mother of all churches, the mother of all churches. In St. John Lateran Cathedral in Rome, this is the chief um, cathedral in Rome that the Pope goes to, to do worship. It says uh, right on the, on the doorway of the church, it says mother and head of all churches of the city and of the world, right? So this is the main church in the Vatican. It says mother, mother and head of all churches of the city and of the world. And it says, according to the Vatican, it must be always clear that the one holy Catholic and apostolic universal church is not the sister, but the mother of all churches, right? So those are words from the Vatican. And we just kind of moving through this. Verse 6, Revelation 17, verse 6. And it says, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Do you remember I talked to you about this Fox's Book of Martyrs? This was just one of the ways that they captured what happened to tens of millions of people that were killed in the inquisitions that happened during the dark ages. History has recorded the deeds of the papacy. And even though now the papacy uh, says that it is sorry for what it has done. Remember, this church says that it doesn't make any mistakes. It is infallible. It is infallible. So what we have seen her do in times past, according to the Bible, she will do again. She will do again. Verse 7, and the angel said unto me, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which have the seven heads and 10 horns. So here's the angel coming back to tell John, I'm gonna break it down for you, John, even more. I don't want you to be confused. I don't want you to worry about what this animal is or what this, this woman is. I'm gonna explain it to you. So he says, I'm gonna tell you the mystery of the woman and the mystery of the beast 
that carrieth her. He says, which have its seven heads and 10 horns. Remember we went through the seven heads? The seven heads were political powers from the time Israel was a nation that came up against Israel and persecuted her. All of these nations were being controlled by Satan. Do you remember when I told you about the priest of Patah that spoke through the leopard like a ventriloquist, right? And they brought the, 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 the leopard back to life by talking through his mouth. Satan does that. Satan speaks and acts through people, through nations, through governments. He takes control. He calls the shots in the background. So we had Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, Rome, and then the revived Roman Empire, which is the papacy. So these were the seven heads. We also saw them as four kingdoms because Daniel, in his time, he starts with Babylon because that was the kingdom that was active when Daniel was here and when he gave uh, the interpretation of the dream in Daniel chapter two, okay? They were also depicted as animals in Daniel 7. What about the 10 heads? The 10 heads were the 10 horns of the Roman Empire. There were 10 of them. Three of them got destroyed, the Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths. In 476, it was part of the fall of Rome. When Rome fell, it divided into 10 kingdoms. Seven of them still remain. Let's pick up at verse 8. It says, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So here we had the beast. Do you remember we talked about uh, Emperor Napoleon? In 1798, he went and he dethroned the Pope. But in the 1920s, 1929 or thereabout, the, the Vatican was restored to its power. So it was, then it was not, and then it was again, all right? Let's look at some more clues. We're still playing clue. Revelation 17, nine. And it says, here is the mind which has wisdom, meaning that pay attention, I'm about to give you a clue. Remember, John is writing from prison. He's writing from prison, so he's got to write a little bit encoded. He says, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So the Vatican was placed on seven hills. Rome is known as the city of seven hills. In ancient times, hills were sacred high places used to worship and offer sacrifices to deity. The gods that they worship in these places were manifestations of the sun god, the moon god, stars god. These gods came as androgenic beings, meaning these gods came either as a man or a woman or a being that had parts like a man and parts like a woman, right? Do you see some of these things prevalent going on right now in, in the world society? But it was actually sat on seven literal hills, seven literal hills. These are the hills, if you're looking on, on the screen, is Quatraline, Esquiline Hill, Catiline, Ser Servian Hill, sorry, um, that's the Servian Wall, um, Aventine, Palatine, Biminal Hill, and then the most important hill was the one called Capital Hill or Capitoline Hill. So these seven hills, the most important was Capitol Hill, and where Capitol Hill was, there was a temple to their god Jupiter. We have a Capitol Hill, and it serves as a temple to the god Jupiter. And at, at the place where the, where the temple to Jupiter was, there was a statue of a fallen angel. There was a statue of a fallen angel. And this particular temple was later rena renamed St. Peter's Cathedral or St. Peter's Basilica. Have you ever seen it? You ever heard of it? We too have a Capitol Hill and on it, we have an identical structure of the one that is in Rome, right? We sit on seven, seven hills as well. Washington DC sits on seven hills and the most important hill there is of course, Capitol Hill. When we go to verse 10, it says there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is and the other is not yet come. Now, at the time of John, when John is writing, it is the, the Roman 
pagan emperors that are ruling the world when John is writing this actual um, revelation. It's around AD 90 or so, okay? And he's writing. And while he's writing, he says, there are seven kings, five are fallen. So if you counted the seven kings or the seven kingdoms that ruled the world, since Israel was a nation, we had Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and then we have the Roman Empire. So John says there are seven kingdoms, five are fallen. So Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media, Persia, and Greece were all gone by the time John shows up, right? And then he says, one is. So which one is? That's the Roman Empire. That was the kingdom that was ruling the world during the time of John. He says, five are fallen, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media, Persia, and Greece are all gone. He says, one is, that's the Roman Empire that is existing now at the time of John. And then he says, the other is not yet come. What was the one that was to come? That it was the Roman papacy. The Bishop of Rome could not take over the empire until that which held him in check was moved out of the way, according to the Apostle Paul. What held the Bishop of Rome in place? The emperors of Rome. The emperors of Rome. And it wasn't until the emperors of Rome moved their, their, their headquarters from, from, the east, from the Western Roman Empire to the Eastern Roman Empire. They moved to Constantinople. And when they moved to Constantinople, the way was open for the Bishop of Rome. L lastly, when we go to verse 11, so let's go back. And it says, and when he cometh, he shall continue a short space. So whoever this, this empire is, number seven, which is the papacy, is going to rule a relatively short time relative to these other empires, right? These other empires have ruled for thousands of years collectively, but this last one is going to rule the Bible says he must continue a short space, a short period of time. Verse 11, and the beast that was and is, is not, <laughs> the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seventh and goeth into perdition. Now, I know this seems like some sort of paradox or parable or riddle, but it's very simple. The beast that was and is and is not, we know that that was the papacy right? It was, was not when it got destroyed by Napoleon and was again. It says, even he is of the eighth. What is the eighth kingdom? That is the kingdom that the Bible keeps talking about, this, this reformed Babylon, Babylonian kingdom, which is a combination of the beast, the papacy, and a prostate Protestantism. We commonly call it the new world order. And it says that he is, he is the eighth, but it also gives you more information. It says he is of the seventh. So this eighth um, head or this eighth kingdom, it has part of the seventh in it. Remember, the papacy came on over. The beast came on over. So part of it is of the seventh. And the last thing that the Bible tells us is it goes into perdition, it means that it's going to be destroyed when Christ returns. Remember the statue at the very end, there were feet that were iron mixed with clay, and it is destroyed by a stone that comes from the sky and hits it on its feet. So the very last thing that happens is that it is going to be destroyed by Christ. It goes into perdition, which is another word for hell or everlasting destruction. Let's pick up at verse 12. Let's pick up at verse 12. It says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords, the king of kings, and they that are with him are called chosen, are called and chosen and faithful. So again, we have the 10 horns, the 10 kings. It's becoming a little bit redundant, but he wants you to just sort of keep emphasizing the point of who they are, and what their situation is. Let's go on to verse 15. And he saith unto me, the waters, remember because he said it sits on many waters. This is the angel explaining what it is. The waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her with flesh and burn her 
with fire. I see Pastor Burrell on there. Hang on. Let me see if I can bring him in. Um, Pastor Burrell, can you hear me? All righty. Hmm. All right. Um, Pastor Burrell? Can you hear there, me? Okay, there it is. I'm I'm allowed. All right, to awesome. I, I didn't see you in the in the in the thread. Um, anything you wanted to comment on on this point? I'm sorry, I don't know what point you. you no sir, on. no sir, no sir. I'm just a just a fly on the wall. Um, you go on ahead. All right. Um, and he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Verse sixteen. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore. And shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. I want you to take a note of two things. It says that these, these 10 horns are going to turn on the beast. They're going to turn on the beast. Do you remember yesterday when we were um, doing, doing the, seven, the seven last plagues? And the sixth plague was that the Euphrates was going to be dried up. And it was symbolic of the, these nations that the horse sat on would turn their back on her, right? And the reason they turned their back on her because the plagues were falling and this beast that claimed to have power and to be able to do miracles was not able to protect them from these plagues. The plagues took away their commerce. The plagues took away their health. The plagues took away their ability to be out in the sun, et cetera. And so they eventually turned on her because they realized that everything that she said was a lie. But look at the punishment. The punishment is that they will burn her with fire. In the Bible, in Leviticus, let me see, I'm, I don't know the verse. Let, let me see if I can find the verse. Leviticus 21, 8. In Leviticus 21, verse 8, it says, if a priest's daughter defiles herself by becoming mm. a prostitute, right? That's the same as a, a whore. She disgraces her father. She must be burned with fire. This is unusual. Any other woman in this predicament, if her father was not a priest and she was a whore, they would stone her. But because her father, who is her father? Her father is God. This particular beast claims that it is a, that God is its father. Remember all of the other nations, they worship other gods, but this one, it says that their God is Christ. It claims that it is the, the God who is in heaven that created us. Right. And you remember, we talked about God's seal and his mark. He had given them the Sabbath day so that they would not get confused about which God they were worshiping. Mm. Of the Ten Commandments, I can keep nine of them to any God. I can make anyone or anything my God and keep nine of the commandments. I can make my wife my God and have no other wives before her. I cannot take her name in vain. Um, I would not make any idols, you know, of any graven images. I could uh, not not um, honor my father and my mother. Not, uh, not, 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 not. That's a tongue twister. I could honor my father and my mother. I cannot commit murder. I will not steal. I would not commit covetousness, cover my neighbor's house or his wife. I can do any of those nine commandments to anything, to anyone. But it is the fourth commandment, the one that says how we are to recognize this God is the one that the beast wanted to change. Remember in Daniel chapter 7, verses 25, it says he thinks or thought to change times and law. The one clear marker that pointed back to God as our creator. In Genesis 2, verse 3, it says that God set apart the seventh day as a memorial so we will always know who our daddy is. Amen. Right? So that was one of the things that they wanted to change. And eventually it says that a, a, a prostitute disgraces her father and she must be burned with fire. Right? And who brings the fire? Right? God brings the fire ultimately. Verse 17. Verse 17. And it says, for God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree. And to give their kingdom unto the beast, unto the words of God, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city, which reigneth over the kings 
of the earth. So if you were wondering who Babylon is, let me ask you, Miss Roxy, is it clear who Babylon is now? Miss Valerie, is it clear who Babylon is? Mr. Edmund, Sister Yvonne, Sister Cynthia, does anybody have any questions who Babylon now is? So the nations of the world will support Babylon and its initiatives. And ultimately, according to the Bible, there will be some sort of death decree, just like it was in Daniel chapter three. But I am grateful, the Bible says, that Jesus will deliver us. We find that in Revelation chapter 19, right? It says that he will come and ultimately destroy this beast, right? I am grateful for that. Listen, I'm gonna go and see what kind of comments we have in the thread. If Pastor um, Burrell has any comments, uh, he's welcome to do that. Um, but as I look in the thread, uh, Pastor Rell, let me know if you have any comments. All right, let's look at some of these. While you're looking, I see one from Sister Tandra. It says, the Bible is a lie. Hebrews 4.12. Mm. It says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit and joints of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You know, that's why the devil don't want y'all studying the Bible. He doesn't. He doesn't want me studying the Bible. He doesn't want any of us studying the Bible because we won't be confused by all of the Hollywood movies and all of the things that people say that Babylon is or the beast is. Do you know we live in an age that people say, I'm a beast? You ever see people, they prowl? I'm right. a beast. If they right. only you. If they only knew who the beast was and what the final judgment that will come upon him, right? Um, let's see. Uh, Go ahead. Sister Sandra says, so if Catholicism is the mother of harlots, then it stands to reason that she has children. That is correct. So she's just noticing that, you know, there's the, the mother church, but then there also um, says that she's a mother of harlots. There are other churches that spin off of that main church that are also unfaithful to God as well. And, and how can we identify a child of their mother, a daughter of her mother? They mm. normally do what? They normally look like them. They normally resemble the mom. They resemble them. That's they, right. They normally have similar characteristics. You know, my sisters look like my mother. They say phrases my mother says. They sometimes, I wanted to say they dress like my mom, but hopefully that's not the case. But you get the point. There were things that my mother does that she passed on to them. Some of them are physical and outward, and some of them are inward. What were some of the physical traits that Babylon, that this mother church passed on? What were some of the physical traits? Some Protestant churches, they still have idols that they worship, some of them. Some of them sort of revere the cross in a particular way, not just as a reverence for Christ, but it actually becomes like a amulet, you know, it becomes like the thing that stops vampires or something, right? So they also have Sunday. Sunday is one of the key ways that you can identify Protestantism in America, right? The, the Catholic Church said it was a unique institution that she created. All of Protestantism keeps Sunday, irregardless of what it says in the Bible. It's because a, a daughter, there are some things that are internal and they do like their parents. Right. I had a um, and Pastor Rell, there's any more comments, we'll take them. But other than that, I'm going to give one short story. Um, I go had a professor. To go the ahead. Story. I was just going to say, go on to, to the story. All right. I had a professor in college. His name was Professor Derek Bow. And mm. Professor Derek Bow, I don't know if he was in Vietnam or fought in some war. I'm not sure. But he had a little bit of a limp, you know, a, a gait when he walked. And he had a son that was three years old. And we would see Derek Bow at church walking around in the balcony and he walked with his unique gait, his unique limp from some injury, from something. And his son that was three years old walked just like his father. There was nothing wrong with the boy. He had no impediment that we knew of, but he walked just like his father. He did what he saw him do. He walked like him. When he grows up, he will probably talk like him he will probably also act like him. We have got to determine who we want to look like and who we want to model ourselves after. And if not Christ, then who? If not Christ, then who? Listen, I'm going to take a minute and I just want to bring it back to cover to cover. 
you know, for the last couple of weeks now, we've been doing this Bible study a little bit over four weeks, so just about four weeks and change. And we've been talking to you about cover to cover. Cover to cover is just a challenge that we kind of put out to ask everybody to read their Bible for themselves. Just read it. And, and if you're new to Bible or new to the Bible study, we were just hoping to, to get you excited enough about what's in the Bible to open it for yourself. And if you've been in the church a day or been in the church 50 years, it doesn't matter. Read it again. The only way that we're going to be able to discover the lies of Satan is to, to look at the original. The Bible says that this word is truth. And it says that the truth will do what? Set you free. So here's the challenge. If you want to go through the Bible this year, we're asking you to um, text me at 202-409-4456. I'm going to give you a Bible reading outline that would allow you to get to the Bible in about a year's time, right? Reading the Bible 15 to 30 minutes a day, depending on how quickly you read. But here's the part of the challenge. We want you to share this Bible outline with 10 other people. It is free. You can give it to them. And when you share it with them, I want you to challenge them to read the Bible cover to cover as well and, and ask them to check in with you. Say, how's the Bible reading going, right? Give me some more information or what did you think about this text? You encourage them, they encourage you. You know, like the ice bucket challenge. I saw people getting on the internet and they would call out their mother or father. Some people call me out and they wanted me to throw ice water on my head, right? Hmm. So I want you to do the same. I want you to go on the internet Put your Bible up and say, listen, I'm challenging dad to take the, the cover to cover Bible reading challenge for 2021. Let's see if we can make this Bible. Can you see what would happen if 30,000 plus people begin to read their Bible in 2021? This is the only sword that the Bible gives us. This is our only offensive weapon. If you go to Ephesians 6, this is the way that we fight back against the devil and also get to have a relationship with God. We get to know him for ourselves. How can you love someone you don't know? Right? So I'm going to challenge you to read it. I'm challenging you to, to step out in faith and go through it. God will give you wisdom. I promise you. He will give you wisdom. Uh, in James 1.5, he says that if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of me, and I will give it to you liberally and without reproach. One of the Amen. reasons that we need to read the Bible the Bible says in these last days, there's going to be a famine in the land, not a famine of bread or of water, but a famine of hearing the word of God. What happens when your neighbor comes knocking and asks you to give them a scripture of encouragement or ask you to give them a scripture to explain what's going on in the world because it seems like it's turned upside down. So we got to hide this word in our hearts so we might not sin against them. And so we can also share it with others. Pastor Rell, any final words before we close out in prayer? I also want to tell you that um, tomorrow we're going to do Babylon is Fallen, chapter 18. Maybe we'll get a 19 too. Who knows? Um, I'm not looking forward to the last day of the Bible study. I've enjoyed it every single day. I've enjoyed being with you. I've enjoyed sharing with you. I've enjoyed listening and sharing with uh, Pastor Burrell. And I'm grateful for all of the beautiful slides. Um, that Cordell Dormer has provided for us and all of the work that my wife has been doing in the background on cover to cover and all of the encouragement that she gives to us. Uh, don't miss the last day of the Bible study. Not sure exactly when that's going to be, but it'll soon come. On the last day, we're going to do um, the, new, the, new, um, the new heaven and the new earth, and we're going to do the new Jerusalem. And I'm telling you, the pictures that Cordell Dormer put together, if you don't cry, when you think about heaven, there's something wrong with you. I'm telling you, it is the most beautiful thing ever. It is the highlight of our Bible study. So if you have missed every day or if your friends missed every day, get them on the last day. I'll make sure to, to remind you when the last day is because it, it is this man's, you know, he just took some pictures that men painted to give you a visual of what they think heaven looks like. And we know it can't do justice. The Bible says, eyes have not seen nor ears heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for his children. John couldn't describe all of this stuff. He did his best to try to explain it. So we're going to show you some pictures that help make it crystal clear. Pastor Burrell? Amen. I have nothing else to add, brothers and sisters. Let's just keep our attention focused on the word of God. Awesome. Pastor Burrell, if you could just close us out in prayer. Yes, sir. Father in heaven, thank you in Jesus' name. Father, you have made it so plain to us. So, so, so plain 
who Babylon is, that Babylon is not by herself. Throughout history, she has spun off daughters into this world. Father, I'm praying right now that you will give each listener wisdom from above to identify this mother church and all the false churches that came out of her. Father in heaven, let us realize that while you love people and you gave salvation to people, that you call out false systems so that we can separate from them and not have anything to do with them. Father, help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Help us to keep our ears open to his word and to his true teachings. We need your grace. We need your sanctification. We need your Holy Spirit to fill our lives, to make us like Jesus. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, I look forward to seeing each of you at the gates of the kingdom. What would it profit us to gain the whole world and to lose our own souls? So until I meet you and greet you, walk with the king today and be a blessing. Today's Bible study is officially over. Elohim bless everybody.